somebody somewhere came up and said that uh, if you get the pawn of an albinism, you'll become richer. You see? He was a loving brother. He was very social to everybody. He would move, in fact, most of our relatives complaining that we, we don't visit them, but he was regularly visiting up to even Kitale, and he was very, very, very caring. And he was very committed to his family. Despite the fact that his wife died and left him behind with two boys and one girl when they were bit very young, but he managed to bring them up. You know, the trafficking of albinism sparked from Tanzania and it spread across. In fact, most of the persons with albinism you'll find in Tanzania, Burundi, Rwanda, even Uganda, they were being attacked and kidnapped and killed. And even some, even on the border of Kenya, they were being whisked away. My name is Robinson Mukwana Nato. Um, if you just remind me about 10 years ago, I just, I just remember about a lot of things that happened to me. One of them is being tra trafficking from here in Kenya to Tanzania by a person so-called Nathan Mte. By that time, I was working at uh, Money Radio. My names are Nixon Logadiru. Uh, I come from a village called Gavudunyi, which is in Hamisi, sub county of Vihiga district or county. This photo is the, the most important photo portrait from my late brother because he, his death was the biggest shock to us, as I'm putting it, especially the albinism fraternity. For, for the last five years, I've been waiting for the justice to be done or executed to the killers, but up to now, in vain. This, this one has really been a very big blow to our family. In fact, my late mother's health deteriorated when this happened to us. We have been staying with the, the community since when my father was married my mother. So we have been asking up to this time with our family that why should this happen to us? I just let, left my family at the age of five years uh, due to, to this, to this circumstance of albinism. Eh? So my father just disappeared. After my father disappeared, uh, he just told my mother, which kind of this child have you brought to me? We are born twins. So I just told me, which kind of this, this son have you brought to me? Then he just said, let the, the, white, the, the white child to die and let the black one to, to live. After his speech, the black one died and the white one remained. So the father disappeared. I just left with, with my mom. So I stayed with my mom, with the three of my sisters. After staying for them for around three, three years, then my mother left me. He just went with girls. By the way, Ayanas was almost to, 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 to kill me. 
I, I remember I was up, the, up here in Mount Elgon, but uh, God was there. So I just, a good Samaritan came and rescued me, just went to stay with the, the good Samaritan. At the age of four, I went to, to Kitale as a street boy. I stayed as a street boy for two good years. After staying for two good years, I was being rescued with, uh, with some Europeans from Australia. Uh, they took me to, to, an, uh, to an orphanage school, which is, it is at uh, Loret, Pioneer State. So I studied there from grade one to, to four. After grade, grade four, uh, here in Loret, Pioneer State, I was being taken to Machakos. Machakos, whereby I, st I studied from grade five to grade eight. Then, so I came back to, to Thika High, school for the visually impaired. So, whereby Mr. Isaac Mora was my guardian. Personally, I went to school. I, I completed my high school in 1987, and uh, I have not been able to get a permanent job. I have been doing contracts, especially with the Electoral Commission of Kenya. They really helped me even put up my house that I'm living with. Uh, God has blessed me with the two wives uh, and uh, six children. My father, was called is Joseph Lugadiru. My late mother was called Ezina. They were both teachers. They were blessed with four children with albinism. We were two, two sons, two daughters. Uh, unfortunately, one, one of my elder sister who was with albinism, she passed on in 1994. And then um, my other brother who was hacked to death was the eldest in our family. And he was living with albinism. So he was attacked in his home by unknown silence. He was cut on the ear. It had a very bad, in fact, the ear almost was almost chopped off. He had wounds on the neck and his hand. I think when he was trying to protect himself from being, getting another panga in the head, I think they wanted to hit on the head. It really hit his hands. All of them, the four fingers. In fact, one was almost chopped off. It was during the night. He was just found lying unconscious on the bed with the whole mattress soaked in blood. We were informed of his uh, attack the following day. We rushed him to hospital where he was uh, hospitalized for about one week. After he was uh, released from hospital, he came home after one week. It's unfortunately, he passed on. Mm -hmm. This is his graveside where he, where he was uh, Later, and then where we are standing was for his wife. There is a, a myth. I, 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 that one, I think it's a myth. And some have put it into a belief that person with albinism body part will make you very rich. And it has, it has really devastated us. Because we are wondering in our life, why should you look at somebody with albinism and you feel that you should kill him so that you get rich or you get a win an election. I just met with a guy known as Nathan Tay, then the guy just took me from uh, here in Kitale. He just, okay, he just tricked me saying that there is a job with there in Tanzania, Mwanza. I, I used to DJ at Imani Radio, then I just, uh, at evening time, I, just, I go to DJ at, uh, there is a, a, a big club here in Kitale known as Makuti. So, I think you know, where, where, when you spin those things, you have a lot of friends. So this guy we just met through that place. So I just trusted uh, him like a friend. So. Whenever he told me that maybe there's a job somewhere, 
I just agreed because he's a friend. Uh, it was 10th of October 2010 uh, when we traveled from Kitale by the bus known as the Prince from Kitale to Mwanza. We just slept to the lodging known as uh, Riverside. Uh, from after sleeping to that lodge for about uh, one week, there's a guy that came say that I told you I want a I want a bone, not a full human human being. So I just I just uh, the the guy just told him I have just come with a with a full full human being, but not a. Uh, not a bonds. So this guy just said that maybe if you want a bonds, just give me like uh, two hours, then I'll just issue it out the bonds to you. After two hours, then that guy, that 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 buyer called again. Told another day, don't do that. I'm coming to to collect the the wool body. So Nathan stay said okay and come with the money because at the morning he had already shown that 20 million. So another day came another day came to me and told me that we at around 3 p.m. we are going to start the job. So I just prepared myself, just packed my luggage uh, at lunch time, I just went to pick my lunch. Then I just I, I came to to the house just to wait there the boss to come so that I can go to to work. Around three three p.m. Another day was being called was being cell phoned. Then after being cell phoned, he went to the to a to a nearby petrol station known as uh, GBP at Mwanza. They he just collected the buyer, then he just, he, they came together to the lodging. Another mute came to my room and called me and told me that yes the boss wants to take us to the to start the job. I say I just told the boss, why have you kept to us that long? The boss didn't answer me. So me, I just went and collect my bag. When while I was collecting my bag, when I turned around, I saw another Mute being pointed with a pistol on his head. Then I just wondered what is going on. Then I asked the the guy who was being who was who was pointing the another Mute pistol on the head. Then the the buyer told me that Robinson, here's the money just showed me the money from the bag. The, the buyer told me that I'm a CID. And the people that you see around here, they're the government of Tanzania. So don't worry. Uh, for further information, come with us. We shall tell you. I didn't took my bag again. I just left my bag to the hotel. Then I just rushed to, with them with the, to the police station. That is Mwanza Police Station. After we went there, the case, uh, the, the the CID told me that uh, this guy, we, we've been looking for him. It is not the first time. This is the third time. First one, he just uh, he just took uh, a body of a dead person eh? from here in Kitale at a place called Kibomet. Uh, and it was a body of a girl who is three years old. So after taking that body, he just took it to Mwanza, still to Mwanza, to those witchcraft. So they told me that Nazan wanted to sell you. By that time, I felt bad, and I felt maybe I could not stay under the sun again. So I felt maybe I'm not like uh, the other human. But um, after, be, after going under counseling and guiding uh, for a few months, I just, gave, I just gave hope again. 
I said there is life and I know God is that for to comfort me. The issue of people believing that our body parts can make people rich is a continued and heightened mystery around how can black parents get white children. And the fact that whiteness has been associated with the wealth because of the white man's burden. Uh, and then coupled with the fact that people are poor and they are superstitious in nature, it has led to uh, the killings of over 600 people with albinism. Uh, in over 28 countries in Africa. And uh, Kenya has not been lost in this one. It's not been left behind. Because in 2009 uh, is when Robinson Mukwana was trafficked all the way from Kitale to Mwanza, Tanzania. And I think he's told you as much. We rescued him, took him to my house, took him to school, and the rest is history. We've even helped him start businesses. I think the last time I talked to him, he had been employed by somebody. Um, and then also earlier on in 2007, there was a lady called Bosibori who was found killed around Isabania and her body private parts removed and, you know, they were gorged out. So later on in 2014, I rescued two children, Bianca Chacha from uh, Gen Korea and Gabriel Kinyanvi Mando at the border of Tanzania. In 2016, we lost Emunok Jamenya Rugadiru uh, in Vihiga. Yeah, so Enab Jamenya Rugadiru in 2016, he was attacked with machetes and he, he, he was killed. In fact, I talked to him when he was in hospital. He succumbed to those injuries. And even now as I speak, I am having to take up an issue of a little child who is, who's gone missing. There's a girl who, with a, there's a, a young girl who was married in Gizangori. They got a child with a, albinism and then uh, he was chased away. She was chased away and then uh, I think the father-in-law went back. And I think it is being said that uh, he, he, he stole the child and the child cannot be traced. So that's an issue. I also have another one called uh, Aisha Awinda in Kisumu. She got a child with albinism and then she was abandoned by the so-called husband. Now I am have, I'm having to help her start a small business. And there are many, uh, those stories are many, there are really many, there are many around young women. Most children with albinism are brought up by, 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 by mothers. So the, the stigmatization and discrimination persists. People still don't ask, accept children with albinism as children. And they are the ones who suffer the most when it comes to this human trafficking and ritual killings. So the time when I disappeared, no one knew. So they just saw me through the media, but uh, they had not, not known about me again. The, uh, the reason why I have not gone to my mom, because he has another husband. Yeah. <laughs> when I came back to Kitale, I was older, so I didn't know the road to the way to, to home, back home. So I came back to Kitale, I just cast uh, to Kitale. So in a good luck, I just met up with that guy. Then he told me, I have your sister. I've married your sister. I, uh, he just told, took me to home, to Kitale. I met up with my sister. So my sister uh, took me to Bungoma, uh, where, where my mom stays. So he took me there, I just met up with my mama. Since then I've, not, I've never gone there again. So right now I'm just staying there, I'm just staying up to Mount Elgon with my brothers and my friends. If you look at the case of Robinson, he, has, he ended up as Moli, Moli children's home. So after he had to leave at some point, and that's how he became even more vulnerable because he had to be employed by a lady called Wanjiro. 
as a, as a watchman. Um, that's how Nathan Mutei, you know, tricked him into going to Tanzania. Yeah. And uh, interestingly, the other day uh, I came across another of Robinson's uh, contemporaries at Moli Students' Home. And uh, it's called Dennis Obilo, who have just helped to secure a job, but he doesn't have uh, albinism. So I'm trying to allude to the fact that those that are vulnerable, whether they have albinism or not, are likely to be abused more because they have nobody to take care of, to take care, to care, take care, to take care of them. And, and if you look at the case of Robinson as well, so the father and mother separated. So the people that brought him up until the time he went to a children's home, because he had become a, 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 street, child, a, a street child, uh, that, that, that separation that primarily happens because of children with albinism being born in the family. So, and uh, issues of poverty because of the fact that these are single parent headed or single mother headed households. That is a common feature in many of the people's stories, uh, persons with albinism. And um, it just goes ahead to show the continuous breakdown of our social fabric. Uh, people don't have the, the traditional way where they were taking care of their, oh, their vulnerable members of society. It remains to be seen that uh, Africans who are old live longer because they live with the family and they are appreciated as such. Uh, but we are not, neither traditional anymore, neither are we modern. We are in between there. We, we, and that in between there is what that makes, you know, with these economic hurdles, People become very, uh, you know, gullible and malleable to believe, believing that uh, killing a, a human being or taking some piece of it, uh, of the body part, would actually make them to be rich. So yes, I want to say without fear of doubt that that vulnerability is what then preemptively, you know, exposes uh, persons with albinism to this uh, human trafficking. When we were initiated, you know, we, we were initiated the traditional way, the Tiriki customs, where we go to the forest and we are uh, uh, put in a small hut for one month. He's the one who took care of us. And we, he really gave us a, a lot of um, inspiration in life. And he was always asking us to read books. His, his death was, created a vacuum in our family. That is the only thing I can explain, that his demise uh, was a big blow to the, our family, which we still miss him up to now, because he was our head. I don't understand why they killed my brother. And uh, what is important is that uh, if they are found, justice must be executed. As John F. Kennedy said, the prize of liberty is eternal vigilance. We've got to keep the vigil so that tomorrow we don't have the stories of Robinson Mufana, Gabriel Kenyanjui, Bianca Chacha, Andrew and Adrian Simiu, and Bosibori, including Renok Jamanya Lugadiru, recurring in our day to day lives. Because it actually beats the logic, it fights the psyche of that collective sense of being a human being. And I want to tell those human traffickers out there, leave us alone. We've got to live our normal lives. We have enough problems to deal with. Don't add others to, to us because you think we are the easiest link to your quest for wealth and fame. We too deserve a life. We do want to self-determine and we want to stand up. And may it be known that even you yourselves could get children with albinism. And I don't think you would want to see any of your descendants having to go through that which you are making others do. Any short term gain and access to power is only a mirage because there is no covariance and there is no scientific evidence whatsoever, neither spiritual, that if you kill persons with albinism, you win elections. You've got the capacity to do so despite the competition on the ground. You don't have to endanger the lives of otherwise innocent individuals and populations simply because of your atavistic propensity towards fulfilling an insatiable greed that can only come through free and fair contestations because that's not the only thing you can do.
Thank you.